All right, so this morning we're going to um, have a, a panel discussion on sustainable agriculture. Um, we've got, we've invited six uh, panelists here. Um, what I've asked them to do is spend a, just a couple minutes um, with a, some brief introductory remarks, um, and then we wanted to open it up uh, for discussion between the panelists and, and you. Uh, so hopefully you have some questions about um, sustainable agriculture, and, and this is a, a, a really, you know, rather enormous topic. Um, so uh, hopefully you have some, some questions that you can ask, and, and we've got really a diverse group of panelists here who can address um, agriculture, so some of the, the issues that are uh, posed by our modern industrial agricultural system, um, and some of the so opportunities and challenges that sustainable agriculture can, can bring in perhaps addressing that. Um, really, uh, you know, my background is, is in environmental science, and there's, uh, there are very few topics when we start talking about environmental issues that can't be at least related to our uh, modern industrial agricultural system. So all of the big headline topics, climate change, um, uh, you know, water pollution, um, health issues, these are all things that, that uh, very strongly are linked to our modern uh, industrial agriculture. Um, so I will, I will very quickly get out of the way here. Um, I'll introduce briefly each of the panelists before they, they give a couple remarks. Um, and, and very, very loosely, uh, and, and this is very loosely, we're, we're kind of going from uh, uh, agricultural production um, through to consumption, but all of the panelists can speak um, uh, about uh, many, many aspects of, of agriculture. So we'll, we'll, like I say, it's quite loose. Um, and so our panelists are uh, uh, Jonathan Ham here is a, a farm educator from Greener Partners. Um, and, and I'll give a little bit longer introduction before each of them speak. Um, Jim Kalambun is the Associate Director for Dining Services here at, at Villanova. Casey Spacht is, I'm sorry, am I saying that last name? Uh, Spate. Spate, okay. Mm -hmm. Is a uh, um, um, General Manager at Lancaster Farm Fresh, who's a, a CSA, um, does get delivered here to, to Villanova. Uh, Dr. Hemiel uh, Perzal, did I get your last name right there? Yes. Okay. Uh, is an Assistant um, Professor of Geography and Urban Studies at <coughs> University. Emily Teal is a food columnist and, and a recipe developer. And Ari Rosenberg is an urban farmer and educator with the Center for Environmental Transformation in Camden. Um, and so we'll, we'll start over here with, with Casey. Um, and, and just very briefly, uh, just say a couple <coughs> words about uh, Lancaster Farm Fresh. Um, this is a, um, a, a farm cooperative that it has about 75 farmers in Lancaster County. It's focused on developing healthy uh, and high quality food um, from uh, uh, their farm uh, and serves Eastern Pennsylvania, um, some parts of, of New York City and um, some of the tri-state area. And it's a nonprofit collective of these 75 farmers um, that raise, uh, humanely um, uh, raise uh, cattle and, and, and other um, animals and uh, um, develop produce and uh, organic produce that they supply to, to customers, co-ops, restaurants, and, and other institutions. So I'll we'll open it up to Casey for a bit. Thanks for coming out. As, as uh, Nathan said, my, um, uh, my name's Casey Spade. I'm the director of Lancaster Farm Fresh Co-op. We're a, um, you know, a nonprofit organic farmers co-op based in Lancaster County. We, we started in 2006. Um, because we, there was a bunch of our, our neighbors, neighbor farmers, going into the same, same areas. And we were, we were concerned because we were growing certain items that, you know, we'd take to a chef, and the chef didn't want those items, but and our, we'd talk to our neighbor, and the neighbor was like, oh, they're, they're buying the, those items from us. And then we were like, well, why are we competing? Why, why am I growing red bell peppers if my neighbor's growing red bell peppers? Why can't I, you know, why, why don't I look to grow something else? So that's basically how we started. We, we started with nine farmers. Um, and we, we have a community-supported agriculture program. We deliver to you know, Villanova here. And we also um, deliver to a lot of restaurants in the city, um, a lot of institutions, other institutions, and um, co-ops and, and buying clubs throughout the area. Um, this year we actually have, uh, I think it's still on our website that we have 75, but we actually have 86 farmers as of yesterday. Um, one, of, one of the, one of the, the proud moments for me that, that I really like to express and talk about is that going into this year we have um, four farmers that are the next generation of existing farmers that, that were founders of the co-op. 
So the, they were able to purchase farms for their children based off the income they made from the, the cooperative, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And you can't really say that, you know, you don't hear that too often these days. So that's one of like my, my proudest moments with the co-op. And just to be, be able to diversify what we have in volume, with volume and, and products, that we can go into these larger, larger um, cities and you know, serve, the, serve the, our communities. We, we look at it as like the Philadelphia is like an extended community of, of Lancaster County. You know, we, we, we really enjoy and appreciate and um, are just, just ex really excited about getting our food into these places because um, by, by providing a, an outlet for these small farms, um, you know, as an organization, it really, really is important to us. We, we don't have, um, we, we kind of look at it as like, we are like the, the small fish forming like a big fish to eat the bigger fish. And that's kind of how we roll. So instead of one farm, you know, um, you know, growing hundreds of acres of one thing or even 10 acres of one thing, we split it off and have like five farms grow three acres of one thing and work it out that way. So that's kind of us in a, in a nutshell. And that certainly speaks to some of the, the sort of scalability issues we're talking about with uh, sustainable agriculture. How do you scale? And, and, and some of these uh, cooperatives are definitely <clears throat> addressing that. All right, Jonathan is uh, with Greener Partners, um, which is a, 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 a <coughs> sort of sustainable farm education um, uh, group. And their mission statement states that they are hoping to connect communities through food, farm, and education. Um, and so I'll let him talk a little bit more about what they do. Yeah, so um, Greener Partners actually has two CSAs, one in Media and one in, in Collegeville. The Hillside location in Media um, serves about 500 families and it's about five acres. So uh, it's um, pretty amazing how much you can grow in you know, a pretty small area with intensive agriculture. Um, but um, you know, the larger issue that we're talking about today with, with cities and, and the, the demand for um, fresh produce in cities is so high. Cities wouldn't exist if it wasn't for petroleum. So it's just something to think about, you know, this, we're kind of in a par little bit of a paradox trying to ameliorate the situation um, of, of low access to, to fresh produce. And so we have our education program that um, we have many different kind of parts to it. Um, our in-classroom activities our school programs um, tend to focus really on just primary um, senses, sensory experiences, connecting people to the source of their food. We find that that's the most important, like really way to people like reach them, like through their stomach, basically. Um, and you know, we try to focus on inspiring um, people into the kind of um, the kind of organic um, production that we do by by how good it tastes and. It's um, it's something that we can um, can, can really enhance um, f uh, food banks and and uh, food distribution um, throughout um, lower income areas. Um, you know, it's good to couple food distribution with some kind of education. What do I do with this? You know, what do I do with these uh, parsley root? I've never seen this vegetable before. You know, I didn't even know how to cook or do anything with parsley root until like just a few months ago myself. So it's really good to like, you know, while I have like little cooking dip demonstrations, um, we'll partner with the food trust and their, um, you know, for their food distribution programs, we'll, we'll um, do some education with them. And also we have our Soul Food, um, which is an after school program and Growing Leaders, which is uh, to support um, Community gardens and school um, gardens um, to give trainings to leaders um, to to help those projects get started um, and uh, education on uh, like uh, SNAPAD you know using EBT and uh, other food stamp um, subsidies in order to um, provide access to fresh food um, and the pro project that I work on is the Farm Explorer which is this trailer. Um, that allows us to do uh, farm, like on farm uh, activities and workshops basically in a parking lot of a school because we find that 
um, as much as we really want to encourage the school gardens to establish that a lot of times the cost is so prohibitive, prohibitive. So uh, this allows us to do the same kind of programming and inspire teachers perhaps to take elements of our curriculum and, and see how vital um, gardening and agriculture could be to, and how it could revitalize um, you know, school curriculum and really fit in with uh, curriculum objectives. So. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, uh, the the idea. Is so, as as we think going from sort of food production and education issues, um, and, and uh, Dr. Hamil Parasol is going to address this idea of um, uh, sort of urban urban agriculture and and social justice. Um, Dr. Parasol is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Urban Studies at Temple University, and she got her PhD um, at Clark University. Here. Uh, and her research bridges uh, several themes in, in uh, human environment and in the human geography. Um, uh, she, she does research on the social dimensions of sustainability, environmental justice, and, and health issues, uh, and community resilience to environmental uh, and economic stressors. Um, and this clicker here will we'll go through your slides. Okay. And feel free to stand up. Do you mind if I stand up? Sure. Well, thanks to you all for being here early on a Wednesday morning. Um, I'm presenting a piece of a project that I've been working on for a few years, and it really came out of my interactions with my students at Temple, who are very enthusiastic about urban gardening, specifically in Philadelphia, because Temple's in Philly. And they saw that urban gardening could do more than address food problems. And so what I'm going to present here are some of the other ways in which urban gardening holds promises for fixing cities, which are seen as sites of um, in some cases, uh, having many different problems. So I did a quick Google search of gardening in Philadelphia, and the returns yielded all these different photos and Google images. And just looking at that array of images, you can begin to get a sense of the different ways in which people conceptualize gardening. Some people see it as a way of mitigating blight. Other people see it as a way of producing food. Other people see it as a pleasant hobby. And then also, if you look at some of these photos, I know it's hard to see from far back, you can see these older images from times past. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for urban gardening right now, uh, but there has been historically too. So even though we're in this moment of great um, fervor over gardening in the city, it's coming out of this long legacy and tradition of gardening in many cities, Philadelphia included. So I'm going to present three different ways in which urban gardens are seen as a solution for some of the issues that cities like Philadelphia are facing. So first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how urban gardens are seen as a way of promoting economic development. Secondly, I'll talk about how gardens have been used as a, a way of providing social services, specifically for youth. And then thirdly, how urban gardening has become, in many ways, a, a vision for a future of Philadelphia that's more sustainable than the current city that we have. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm in the way. <laughs> I feel like people can't see. No problem. <laughs> Uh, so beginning with urban economic development, I say, I, I'm a geographer and I, I love maps, so you'll have to forgive me for this slight indulgence. Um, <laughs> but it's really very interesting. Philadelphia yeah. has been struggling with the issue of vacant lots for decades. And if you look back to 1990, there were 15,000 vacant lots, which already sounds like a fairly large number. And today, the number varies a little bit, but it's up to 40,000. So here's a, a, a map of, it's not entirely up to date, but a, you get a sense of the locations of these 40,000 vacant lots, and you can see that they're not evenly distributed across the city of Philadelphia. They're concentrated in certain neighborhoods. Also, if you look at a map of unemployment, and this is taken from 2010 census data, you can also begin to get, to get a sense that there are certain neighborhoods that are affected by both large quantities of vacant lots as well as high unemployment rates. So people are starting to think about gardening as a way of converting all these vacant lots in neighborhoods with high unemployment into sites of production where people could be employed or they could be using these areas for other types of purposes. Now, some, in some cases, this effort to convert vacant lots into gardens has been successful, but in other specific uh, examples, there have been some concerns about the, the success of these neighborhoods in revitalizing. So previously, this particular garden at 2100 Fitzwater was um, 
a community garden that stretched over three different lots. A lot of people poured their time and efforts into it. You can see it in this Google Maps uh, image here. And then one of the lots was sold and turned into a house. And so depending on who you are, you might have different perspectives of that. If you're in the city of Philadelphia, you might say, well, hey, this is great. We got an investor who came in, took this vacant lot that was just being informally maintained as a garden. We turned it into a house. If you talk to the gardeners, they say, you, you took our land. You took all this labor that we've been putting into it. So this idea of urban economic development and thinking about gardens as a tool for that raises a lot of questions and critiques because people get very concerned that gardening is seen as a a temporary stopgap measure until something better comes along, loosely defined. I'm not defining it right now, but there are different ways of conceptualizing it. So second initiative. Oftentimes, well, not oftentimes necessarily, but in many cases, gardening is seen as a way of promoting youth development, providing the social services for youth. And I want to point this out because I think there's been an evolution over time in how these youth programs are being conceptualized. So I think if you dig back into the 90s, Here's a quote from an article that was published in 1986. Um, people saw this opportunity to participate in gardening as, a, as an alternative to other types of activities. So gardening seen as, as um, this indication of hope, something where we can um, plant some flowers, plant some vegetables, see them grow, and it's inspiring in some way. Now, more recently, there's been a push for turning these types of gardening skills into uh, something useful in terms of transferable skills for employment down the road. Um, so in, in this quote, based on some research that I did, one particular group was really emphasizing financial literacy. So youth that were involved in the gardening program, not only were they learning how to plant things in the ground, they were also learning how to keep ledger books and how to run a market. So they were gaining these other skills that could be used both within gardening as well as outside. And then other groups were even emphasizing that not only could people use these programs as a way of learning transferable skills, but also how you could turn it into a long-term career path within urban agriculture. So now urban ag, to some extent, is being seen as a profession that really has legs for promoting economic development in certain areas. All right, so the, sorry, I'm going through all this very quickly, but it's just very exciting. So we'll, we'll get to the Q&A, so we can talk about it more. So the, the third vision is thinking about how gardening can transform Philadelphia. And so I assume that many of you, because we're kind of close to Philly, have, have been to Philly at some point. And when you're going to Philly, you might not necessarily think about Philadelphia as a sustainable city, even though there are a lot of programs that are in place to, to change that reality. And I think gardening is seen as a, a very visual cue of how Philadelphia is becoming more sustainable. If you drive past a big, beautiful garden in southwest Philadelphia, you start to think, Philadelphia is a green city. And in some ways, this is evocative. And if you look back to how William Penn conceptualized the city, he thought about it as a city that was very green, where each house was on a lot that provided space on either side for growing. Now, if you go into the heart of Center City today, houses do not have space on either side for growing. But people are thinking about ways in which we can uh, green the city quite literally, as well as in other ways to make it more sustainable. So I'll. I'll, guess, uh, I'll leave us with this final note of, of really thinking about what Philadelphia might be in the future. And uh, there have been some different ways of reconceptualizing the ways in which we can bring back Philadelphia or rebuild Philadelphia. And some people see the role of vacant lots and gardens as a way of um, completely transforming the city, as providing this new start. Uh, some people call it architectural genocide, in other words, knocking down some of the, the row houses that are in Philadelphia that have been abandoned and replacing them with other things, or maybe replacing them with open land, um, or ultimately a way of, achieve, of achieving this low density city. So in other words, there's this tension between Philadelphia having uh, lots of vacant, well, vacant lots that could be converted into green space, promoting this lower density city, um, versus having Philadelphia be a site where people are, are, are moving back and promoting that high density lifestyle that we might more traditionally associate with sustainable. So, I'll conclude there. Great. Thank you. All right, Ari Rosenberg is a um, urban farmer and educator with the Camden Center for Environmental Transformation. Um, she's an activist working to create a more just society through community organizing and action. 
Uh, and she's been growing food for over 12 years in, in both rural and urban environments. Um, and she serves on the board of directors of the Mill Creek Farm in West Philadelphia and uh, serves on the advisory committee for the Rooted in Community, which is a, a national network of organizations that work with uh, youth and food. Great, thanks. Um, that was a perfect segue into the work we do um, over in Camden. So behind me are just images. I don't have a full presentation, but I think um, you know, images say a lot more about work than, than sometimes what we say with our words. But you know, o over in Camden, um, what, what we're doing is not, is not just about sustainable agriculture. Um, it's, we really focus a lot on the idea of sustainability as a whole thing and like what that means in your whole life um, and the idea of food access. So as, as some people probably know, Camden is on the list of like the top 10 um, food deserts in the country, which is not like an exciting top 10 list to be on because it means that people don't have access to you know, affordable, fresh, healthy foods. Um, in the neighborhood that we focus most of our energy on, which is Waterfront South, it's in South Camden, um, there are no grocery stores, no supermarkets. Um, there's four corner stores, and the options at the corner stores are extremely limited. Um, you know, they have iceberg lettuce and potatoes, and they're like hiding in a corner, and then they're hard to find. Um, you know, there's no like low sodium like canned beans. It's hard to find fresh fruit there. Um, you know, it's very, very hard, and then it's also expensive, way more expensive than going to Wegmans or going to ShopRite would be. Um, and so we are growing food in South Camden in order to have fresh produce that's available for residents of that neighborhood. Um, and, you know, last year we grew a little bit over 2,300 pounds of food. Um, our goal this year is probably closer to 2,800 pounds of food. Um, and the idea is for most of that to, s to stay in Waterfront South and for what doesn't stay in Waterfront South should stay in Camden as a whole because Waterfront South isn't the only you know, neighborhood that has this issue. And so we have a weekly farmer's market um, from sort of the end of May through the middle of November that our teenagers run and they do learn financial skills. Um, and it's used, you know, not just to provide access to, to fruits and vegetables, but also as sort of a community gathering point, a way for people to come together, see their neighbors, um, see the teens that we're working with, and really, you know, celebrate the community that we have there. Um, we also focus a lot on education. You know, access to food isn't the only problem. There's also a barrier with education. If, if you've never heard of a rutabaga, what are you going to do with it? Why would you buy it at a farmer's market stand? You don't know what that thing is. It looks weird. Um, doesn't smell that great. And so, you know, our teens every week, they pick, they pick a vegetable of the week to do a taste test with or make some sort of easy recipe. Um, so there are samples at the market. We hand out the recipes at the market, and it's a good way to highlight the vegetables. We've also been partnering with the Food Bank of South Jersey. They do these six-week long cooking matters nutrition classes. They get produce from, from our gardens. Um, and use them in the cooking classes. The classes, they have different classes. So they have some classes are just for adults, some are for families. Um, and everyone that's in the class gets to take home vegetables that they use in the class along with the recipes so that they can, you know, practice what they learned in the class at home. And, you know, in addition to learning more about, you know, cooking and nutrition, they are also expanding their palate and they're realizing, whoa, like maybe I actually do like rutabaga. It looks weird, but it doesn't taste that bad. Um, and so a lot of the stuff we're doing is about that sort of education and how, you know, how do we expand what people are interested in because, you know, not having access to fresh fruits and vegetables is only part of the problem. You have to know that you actually want to eat them. Um, and so we, we really try to work on that. So in the pictures you can see, you know, the, the top left corner is our farmer's market stand. Um, it's two of our customers, one of our teenagers and a, a summer intern who actually went to Villanova. Um, is in is in that picture. And so it's just you know it's like a table with vegetables, and it's really you know a low key thing. We just you know try to try to be real with people. We have a you know an EBT machine, so we can accept food stamps, um, and you know make it as accessible as possible. On the right hand side is our greenhouse. Um, we grow. Last year we grew thirty seven hundred seedlings. This year it's probably going to be at least a thousand more than that. Um, 
We use the seedlings in our own gardens. We also sell them um, to, well, we, we sell them to make money and we sell them to um, sort of local organizations at a lower cost. We also, we work in a number of the schools in Camden. And so for those schools, the seedlings are free. It's just part of the service that we offer. Um, and we, you know, we basically, you know, teaching people how to grow their own food and giving them the autonomy and that skill set you know, is going to help them forever. So we want to make sure that more people have access to it. So if someone can't afford the seedlings, we'll just give them away. Um, if, it's hard to see in the picture, but there's like this bike in our greenhouse. And that's because part of what we do is also about stormwater management. Um, Camden has a lot of issues with stormwater. It's an old city, so it's a combined sewer system. And there's a lot of flooding, which is really dangerous. And so on the side of our greenhouse, we actually have a gutter. Um, that collects water and it funnels it into the greenhouse and then the bicycle is attached to a pump and so we can pump water from um, rainwater to water our plants so that's pretty cool and unique um, the bottom left hand corner is just one of our garden sites we have five garden sites um, throughout waterfront south and you can see one of our teens working in the gardens and then on the right hand side um, two of our teens are squishing harlequin beetles our arch nemesis um, <laughs> And so our, our programs, we really focus on, you know, from elementary school through adulthood. And so elementary school programs, we have programs during and after school. Um, we have a Food Corps member, and Food Corps is like part of AmeriCorps. It's a national program that's not in every state yet, but they're each year they add more states. Um, and the service members serve with certain organizations. They're really focused on um, working to end childhood obesity through nutrition education, gardening education, and changing food procurement in schools. Um, so we have a service member serving with us who's doing all of our children's programs. And then we do have employment training programs for teenagers. Um, we hire 12 new teenagers each year. And you know, we think of our program as it's a person development program. So yes, they're, they're learning how to grow food, and that's great, and maybe they'll love it. I don't care if they love to grow food. What I care about is that they are using the program to get skills that they can use to do whatever they want to do. You know, so some of our youth want to you know, be beauticians. Some of them want to be engineers. If they can use our program to help advance their goals, then it was successful. They don't have to ever get their hands dirty again as long as they're, they're getting something out of that program. Um, and then this year, we started a new program for teens who have already done the entry level program. And they're, they're coming back and they're leading the other teenagers. So they're developing all the workshops. Um, they're leading the workdays in the garden. They're helping with the nutrition class. We're starting a value-added product this year. We're making hot sauce and they're leading that. Um, doing all the like budgeting to figure out how much we should charge for the hot sauce, everything. Um, and so it really is like a skill builder. And you know, Camden has a very high unemployment rate and a high youth unemployment rate. And so we're trying to sort of help change that story a little bit, you know, we can only hire a few youth because we are very small, but eventually it will be big. Um, and then we partner with the food bank to do adult cooking classes. So we really are trying to see like a whole spectrum. Um, and we understand, you know, the amount of food we're growing isn't enough to sort of like change the whole agricultural system, but we're not, tr we're, I, you know, I would love personally to change the whole agricultural system, but I know that that's not something one organization can do. That's something that we all do by deciding where we buy our food. And so making you know, an economic decision to go to a farmer's market instead of a grocery store, and that's something that consumers have to decide to do, and you know, we can just provide options. So I'll sort of leave it there. Great, thank you. All right, James Columban is the uh, Associate Director of Dining Services here at Villanova. Uh, he's a registered uh, dietitian and nutritionist, um, and uh, thought he could uh, be sort of interesting for, for some of the students to, uh, to hear what he has to say um, considering you eat some of the food that, that dining services uh, provides. Um, and, and just a, a note, um, not that this is directly related to sustainable agriculture exactly, but uh, Villanova Dining Services does um, have a commitment to sustainability, um, and they've uh, instituted a number of measures, things like um, organic and local food products, uh, certainly not all of them, but, but trying to increase the number of local and organic food products, sustainable seafood, fair trade coffee, uh, composting, other sustainability measures in, in the, the dining services arena. But, uh, James can uh, talk a little bit more about that and about some of the health issues as well. Well, thank you, Ms. Anna. And um, I 
want to also thank the, the panelists for your, uh, your profoundly impactful work that you're having, uh, not only immediately in, in, in your areas and in your neighborhoods, but, uh, and for this time, but I think for, for eternity too. It prepares a person, um, not only uh, providing them skills and awareness and education and products as a bridge to something even better, but a foundation too that will last them for a lifetime. So I think that is the inestimable work and impact and press that you all are having is amazing. And we like to think that we do the same thing in dining services and I, I always like to say that um, the foundation and framework of our sustainable plan and all those great things that you just cited there that we're involved with uh, is based on not the providing of something to our customers, our staff, and our students, but also the removal, most importantly, the removal. That is the removal of trans fats um, and partially hydrogenated oils and providing also very nourishing, um, highly nourishing uh, fruits and vegetables, a plant-based diet that, that individuals can, uh, can enjoy, not only just visually, but culinarily. I like to call that culinary chemotherapy because the, the pigments in our, in our food supply uh, act in a very specific uh, chemotherapeutic manner um, in a non-toxic way that fortify the tissues and cells of our body. And um, I like to think that uh, those miracle molecules, they will take place and move into the cells and all the different tissues, providing the support and, and care to the cells from probably the most environmentally impactful event that takes place um, millisecond after millisecond. And that is just our, our metabolism alone creates such noxious exhaust within our own bodies. Of the 100 trillion cells that are inside your body, there are an average about 280 million fat molecules that they all need support. So each cell, each one of those 100 trillion, is 280 million fat molecules. And about 25 to 35% of that is turned over each day. And it's very dynamic, the cell. And it's reliant on our, our diets to get the, the healthy, I like to call the smart fats. And the smart fats are really based on uh, the, and rooted in, in plants and how the plant locks in the, uh, those, those wonderful molecules, fat molecules. Some of them are ingested by uh, our cattle and uh, grass-fed beef, lamb, etc. And we, in turn, will, will consume that, that meat and, uh, and derive the benefit of uh, grass-fed or plant-fed animals. What's really amazing, too, um, and I just, just learned this not too long ago, the Stonyfield story, Stonyfield yogurt, um, they, they did quite a bit of study on, uh, on feed of the animal and methane production. Of course, methane is, is a molecule that's somewhat 20, some 20 times more potent than <laughs> CO2. Uh, in, in terms of greenhouse gas and trapping um, uh, greenhouse gases. And so what they did is they discovered through, I think, the French to uh, replace uh, some of their feed uh, with flax, using flaxseed. And that reduced the amount of flatus or gas or methane going into the air, and it increased their, their <laughs> omega-3 fatty acids in their, in their milk and in their flesh. So the same thing can happen to, with human beings, that as we increase the um, plant intake, our, our flesh, our bodies, our, all of our cells uh, increase in omega-3s and omega-6 fatty acid. It's real important to, to realize that um, they are responsible for oxygen uh, attraction. And oxygen uh, is very important for the cells to, to respire, to, to communicate, to exchange ions. And it has been known for about 100 years now that if you reduce the amount of oxygen as little as 35% to a cell, it gets sick. It does. Chronic and degenerative disease is, is rampant. And um, 
you will hear and you can Google and you can watch so many different programs on nutrition and human nutrition and you'll find that it's often very confusing and confounding. You know, what is the, the best diet? You know, low carb, you know, high carb, you know, the right types of fats. It's, it's just um, very confusing out there. So we also like to provide some education, some, and if you will, snippets, if you will, throughout uh, our dining services um, in combined with uh, healthy food and provide that. So uh, it's in a removal of those PHOs or trans fats. And uh, what happens with the trans fats is that uh, they're referred to as damaged fats. They don't attract oxygen um, necessary for the cell to stay healthy and alive. So um, in that case, they're, they're poisonous, very toxic. So that was one of the greatest things that we have done, is to remove PHO and trans fats. And then next, to provide uh, a, a very colorful salad bar, healthy salad bar. And you'll find that uh, all those wonderful colors that you see in you know, the yellow and red bell peppers and the, and the tomatoes and, and beets um, are in a family called carotenoids. And we're all familiar with like beta carotene. But there's some really fancy and delicious other uh, members of that carotenoid family. Uh, cryptoxanthine, lutein, uh, lycopene that you may have heard of in tomatoes. And when you eat those wonderful vegetables and, and dishes that contain pigments, plant pigments, that they work their way into the cells, cell structures, and especially the, the gap junctions or the little channels in between each cell, it's important for cells to communicate and exchange messages and ions. It's kind of like their, uh, their communication channel. In the absence of carotenoids, what happens is that the channel or the corridors in between cells lose their, their patency. They lose their, their, their firmness, their plumpness. They collapse because they need nourishment, they need support, so they collapse. And they stop communicating and exchanging ions and, and oxygen. And we can almost draw human analogies to that when we stop communicating. Our relationships you know, and our health collapses, I believe. Uh, so do cells. And it's very interesting to watch in, with electron micrography the, uh, the, the chronic and degenerative disease. The initiation point starts when the cells start shutting down and stop communicating, stop breathing. So the object of, our, of the game in life, the enjoyable part of sitting down and breaking bed, bread, is to get enough of those miracle molecules in our plant system. And uh, our responsibility as dining services is to provide that. And so we have probably one of the largest salad bars in, in Dockery Hall on this side of the, the country. And, um, and in fact, it's vegan, uh, a very good part of it. And I made the decision to move the meat and the cheese, the animal proteins, on the end of the salad bar and so there is not any fallout or cross-contamination, which I think is very important for those who are trying to follow a vegetarian or, or vegan uh, lifestyle and diet. So um, I think those are some of the really important things uh, and kind of like our foundational uh, efforts and ideas that we're making in dining services. And I hope that everyone will appreciate that. And I'm open to further Q&A on that, but I'll stop there. Great. Thanks, Jim. All right, and then last but certainly not least, uh, Emily Teal is a food columnist uh, and recipe developer. Um, she's uh, uh, written for Grid Magazine. Uh, she's a regular contributor to Serious Eats, uh, which is the De, De Bruno Brothers blog, um, FUBU's, which is the food blog of the Philadelphia Magazine, um, and, and as I mentioned, Grid Magazine. She's uh, an alumna of uh, Bryn Mawr College, just down the road. Um, and uh, she has a legacy award winner with the Women's Culinary Organization, La Dems Escoffier International. We'll work on your French pronunciation. <laughs> 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 French is terrible. Uh, and she completed a, a Master of Arts in Food and Culture and Communications at the University of Gastronomic Sciences. Um, she's passionate about food and committed to the idea that everybody deserves access to meals that are nourishing and satisfying. So if it didn't come across already, um, I have an agenda 
uh, with my recipe development work specifically, um, and I do regular recipe development for Grid Magazine, but really um, to kind of challenge a, a lot of what's out there in terms of recipes. I mean, uh, you just mentioned that, you know, there's so much information about what people should be eating, what people shouldn't be eating. Michael Pollan already wrote the book about what, what to eat, what not to eat, um, and as did Marion Nessel. You know, there's, there's really good foundational stuff out there, and that's largely eat whole foods, minimize meats, uh, minimize uh, uh, these added sugars, and, and from there you really can't go wrong. So in my recipe development work, I really try to um, get people think thinking seasonally, first of all. I know that's hard in a, in a big university setting uh, to cook uh, solely seasonal foods, but um, you know, to get uh, Lancaster Farm Fresh CSA members um, or farmers market shoppers when they encounter something like parsley root or rutabaga, um, instead of just putting it in the crisper and allowing it to languish there until it is so dead that it has to go in the compost bin. I'm getting folks to think about, uh, you know, how to, to view these maybe unfamiliar vegetables as challenges um, that can actually turn into, you know, favorites that, that then uh, become, you know, regular meals in the rotation of uh, people's households and their families. Um, and then also uh, to get folks, uh, you know, kind of challenging um, the restaurant mindset in some ways that you have to have a piece of animal protein anchoring a plate. You know, that it's not a restaurant meal if there's not a piece of meat, a piece of fish, um, or even uh, or even a piece of, of soy protein necessarily, you know, a vegan protein, um, you know, that's, that's anchoring the plate to get people formulating their meals in slightly different ways so that uh, they're getting good nutrition, they're getting whole foods, but they're, and that meals are uh, colorful and um, full of texture and that they're dynamic and pleasurable experiences that we all want when we sit down at the table without having them be, you know, these boring, uh, boring troughs of, of uninspired vegetables or, you know, resorting to that, like, meat and three that that I think people feel sometimes that they have to resort to. Um, so that's some of what I do for Grid in a, in a monthly column there. Um, getting folks to focus on vegetables, getting folks to think seasonally about what they're eating and connect with the pleasures that come out of that. And then also realizing that it doesn't have to be a dogmatic attachment to seasonal eating to eat really well mm -hmm. and to incorporate seasonal foods and to incorporate local foods um, into, into one's life in a really foundational way. Um, and then the other side of what I do is really um, about storytelling. Um, and my whole goal with my, with my writing work, and I write um, uh, a lot of restaurant coverage and a lot of sustainable kind of food producer coverage um, for GRID, uh, is, to, is to kind of get the stories out there, some of which you've heard today, of folks who are really working in their community to, to, to build their community. Um, and to do that through food and to do that through agriculture as ways of, of people connecting with one another. I think for me, um, working in sustainable food for the last decade has been largely about finding these connections and finding and supporting um, these uh, real craftsmen, craftsmen and women who are um, uh, building something tangible. Um, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you buy a, a box of cereal, yeah, you can eat some cereal, but nothing about that feels meaningful to me. It might to you. I mean, Cinnamon Toast Crunch has its place in, in a healthy diet, I have no doubt. But um, uh, but the idea that, that when you eat, and we all eat so often, that you can be engaging not only with that specific food item, but with the people who, who, ma who made it, the people who's you know, s sweat equity went into that uh, production of that eggplant or that parsley root or whatever it happens to be. Um, I think that there's real there's a real opportunity to be inspired there. So that's really what I'm trying to do with with my my written work um, to to try to connect folks to those stories so that the experience of eating, um, whether it's a, a an organic apple from you know Washington or a, or a local apple from Adams County. Um, means something to them so that it translates uh, in some ways. Um, so some of my work kind of focuses uh, specifically on the agricultural side of things, but also on the consumption side of things. You know, we've got a voracious appetite for food media in Philly. Uh, people are curious about chefs, they're curious about restaurants. We've got a great dynamic food scene. If you're not all dining out downtown, please, please go. There's great restaurants. Um, and uh, it's 
pretty budget friendly, relatively speaking, to other cities. Um, so uh, one of the one of the real aspects of sustainable food does really enter into that restaurant world, and um, it's that same idea of not having to have the meat uh, at the center of the plate, but sustainability also translating to you know. What, what are the worker issues going on in that restaurant? You know, what are the, um, where does the human aspect of sustainability enter in? Um, not just, you know, is this res restaurant recycling, but are they taking advantage of, of, their, uh, of their workers? Are they specifically hiring undocumented workers so that they can take advantage of them? The idea that food sustainability, it doesn't just come down to the food on the plate, but it really manifests in all these different orbits of uh, the experience of buying food, of preparing food at home, of eating food in a restaurant, uh, and that the, those issues can really uh, have some dynamic, interesting intersections. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'd like to open this up to questions and, and, and discussion between the panel and, and audience, um, a bit informal, so please, if you have questions. Um, I, I'm, it's for the, the folks that are doing the urban farming, what kind of efforts do you make to test the soil before you actually plant in the ground and then you have a greenhouse? Yeah, um, we make a tremendous amount of effort to make sure we test our soil before we plant into the ground. So heavy metal contamination is a huge problem in urban environments, especially older cities like Philadelphia and cities with lots of um, like, I don't know how to explain it, lots of recycling facilities and like horrible destroyer, environmental destroyers like Camden. Um, so we've been partnering with the USDA. Um, they do free soil testing using this very cool radar gun. Um, they're actually testing some of our gardens today for us. Um, and it's, um, the technology is a lot better than um, the normal soil testing technology, which is where you just go and dig a bunch of holes and you mix all your dirt together and you send in a sample of dirt this big and then they say, oh, there's like a little bit of lead in there or not that much or whatever. Uh, but that's all your soil mixed together. And so then you don't know if there is lead. Is it lead everywhere? Is it lead just in this one corner? You don't know where it is. And so the USDA, they're mapping all of our gardens using this radar gun and they, I can see on the map exactly what areas of our gardens have lead contamination or no contamination or arsenic contamination. Um, and we've been doing it, so we've, we've done all of the gardens that we produce vegetables in. Um, today they're doing one of our orchard sites, which is a little bit, we wanna know, but less important as far as, you know, lead doesn't transfer into the fruit of fruit trees, but we wanna know, so if we wanna do ground cover, we know if we can eat it or not. Um, and we're doing two of our school gardens today also. Um, the USDA does that service for free, um, and they come to us. So it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, but that's very important. Can I just ask, do they do that for every organization or just for large? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I know like the USDA office we're working with is in New Jersey, so I don't know in Pennsylvania. If it's um, different, maybe you can talk to that. Yeah, I mean, that. I know that like when we do, um, work to support uh, school gardens and community gardens we mainly just um, you know recommend doing raised beds because it becomes something that's prohibitive for people um, you know to be able to test their their soil I mean it's just it's the soil testing is much cheaper than a raised bed like a normal soil test is only forty dollars which it costs less than buying lumber and bringing in soil and everything that a raised bed that, that's true, um, but for people to know necessarily whether or not they have contaminated soil is often prohibitive for them. So we don't, we just recommend doing raised beds. Mm -hmm. it, in these urban environments, is it pretty safe to assume that a lot of the soil is going to be contaminated in, though? Yeah, mm -hmm. in, no. in some of the uh, areas like that we work in in Chester, um, it, you know, it's pretty, um, it's, I mean, I don't know if you could just assume that they're all contaminated, but it's it's very likely in, in Chester. Yeah, so. I mean, I think you need to test to know, but uh, no, a lot, surprisingly, a lot of lots aren't actually contaminated or have very low levels. Um, and then, you know, fruiting plants, um, well, so lead and most heavy metals go into the leaves first. And so if you have a low level of contamination, you can still grow things like 
eggplant and tomatoes and you don't have to worry about it getting into the fruit but you wouldn't want to grow spinach or collard greens or lettuce um, because then it would be being passed on through your food um, so my recommendation is to always test you sh you, if you haven't tested you should assume there's contamination but the reality is there's actually yeah. less contamination than you would yeah. think um, but if you don't test you don't know and it's better to be safe and make sure that you know if you want your vegetables to actually be nutritious for you you want to make sure there's not heavy metals in them um, but definitely you know the cooperative extensions do soil tests in every state um, they're usually only like 30 or 40 bucks for um, for lead tests it's definitely worth doing um, yeah I can I can connect people with resources if they contact me on how to do um, that kind of testing is very easy When you do come across contaminated soil and if the contamination levels are high enough, do you remove the soil or do you try to remediate it? Remediate it. Um, so I like using sunflowers because it seems they're pretty and they take um, heavy metals out of the soil. The only thing to be really careful with is once you grow it and it's full of metals, you can't compost it. You actually you have to like put it in a landfill, um, which always feels really weird to be like bagging up plants. Um, but they're now toxic and full of heavy metals that you don't want in your compost. Um, but s sunflowers are good. The, the, the thing is, you know, we have the luxury of having multiple places. So if, if I have contamination at one site, um, you know, I, if I plant that in sunflowers for a year, I'm not really losing out. I can still grow food on another site. For other people, if that's their only site and they really want to grow food, then that might not be the best method for them because um, that can take multiple years to remediate. Raised beds work for low levels of contamination. If there's super, super high levels of contamination, like in Camden, there's a lot of super fun sites and um, brown fields. And to clean those up, it actually takes the EPA to come in and do all these like really fancy remediation things. And so if someone's site um, is more than a low level, then you know, it's, it's best to actually, yeah, do soil removal, because even raised beds, you know, your raised beds 12 inches, which is what the recomm recommendation is, you know, most roots grow more than 12 inches. There's only a few plants that have shallow roots. Um, so if this is how big your raised bed is and you grow a tomato plant, I guarantee you that that root is going below your 12 inches. Luckily, tomatoes aren't going to pass on low levels of lead to you. But, you know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, this much difference really is going to be the end, or end all be all, but it's not, you know, vegetables have long roots and roots can grow through almost anything. So some people are like, oh, but I put landscape fabric down. You know, there, there are things growing through your sidewalks, you know, mm -hmm. like plants have, sh roots are strong. So unless there's like, I don't know, like four inches of concrete there, I guarantee your roots growing through it. So yeah, just, there's tons of ways to remediate. If it's really heavy, you need to remove it. Um, but if it's a low-level thing, sunflowers are awesome. Wow. Could I just ask, with the sunflowers, do the metals get concentrated in the seeds or in the leaves? It's in the, in the stalks, but I wouldn't eat those seeds. I wouldn't save them even. I would get rid of them. But I, like squirrels still eat them and birds eat them. And yeah, I think they don't die from it, in my experience. So, so. I have a question for Mr. Colin Ben. Um, I really appreciate the efforts that Dining Services makes, and my students always really enjoy hearing from the director of Dining Services, and I, I'm thrilled to hear your perspectives and hear how much knowledge you have. Uh, and hearing you talk in such detail about nutrition reminded me that I've had a number of students over the years, um, some of them might even be here, who have said they're really regretful that there isn't a nutrition class available outside of the nursing school and they really wish uh, that, that there was some way on campus for them to learn uh, mm -hmm. from someone with expertise about nutrition. So I, it just made me want to ask if Dining Services has ever considered um, having someone like you do a monthly seminar or even teach a course through the Arts College. I guess the, as I understand it, Ruth, maybe you can clarify, but the I've been told that students can't enroll in the nursing college nutrition course unless they're in the nursing no, college. No, that's not true. They can. Oh. Okay. They, they, there's actually two nutrition courses that would probably be great for um, any of the undergrads. 
our typical nutrition course. Well, there's actually three. Then there's a healthy lifestyles course, mm -hmm. and then there's global nutrition, mm -hmm. which has a lot of stuff to do with sustainability that, that is very popular. Mm -hmm. So, oh, that's interesting. And somehow so that's the oh word credit getting out yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> but I guess I still, I I would have the question if um, it, it's great that these classes are more accessible than I realized. But have you thought about doing a, you know, a monthly seminar or? or some sort of non-credit education for students. Yes, I have. I would enjoy doing that. I should, you know, pursue that. I think, yeah. and I'm pleased to know that those classes are accessible and probably count uh, against maybe some science. Yeah, or electives. Yeah. Or electives. Yeah. The global nutrition is really popular. Okay, well, that's good to hear. I think the time is right. I mean, being in this industry for nearly 20 years, there's more interest in nutrition in the sustainable uh, aspect to that than ever before. And, um, and I'm, I'm very happy, so I, I would like to be able to pursue that. I think there's a lot of interest in this. I think so, too. So, somebody had asked before the panel started that, that, that there are flyers around campus and, and mm -hmm. some of the bathrooms. Is that is that you're doing about the health I think that's health and the health services. Um, mm -hmm. The dietitian, yeah, Chris, Christy, Kristen? Yeah, the Stall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right, Stall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good um, nuggets of wisdom for yeah. you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. Um, so I've heard that uh, transforming, making lots of cities into gardens, um, whether edible or not, helps to reduce crime rates. And so that's another benefit. I mean, you know, I know we were talking about the economic benefit of turning into a home. But do you see that in your research? As, as yes, I have come across other studies that have linked uh, vacant lot reclamation to reductions in crime. And some of those have been done in Philadelphia. But that's not a specific aspect of the work that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, too, you said that um, for, for some of the, the, the idea of having these, these lots on a RA report, I know. Um, that this can turn into to a job, uh, a, a long-term, these are employment opportunities in, in places where employment is, is perhaps pretty high. How, how does that work? How, do, do people in an urban setting in, in some of these lots actually make a living off of this? Do you, uh, do you want to answer well, through a research lens? I, 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 I might have a more skeptical skeptical okay. perception, well, so you should not. go first. Okay, no, <laughs> okay. I, I, would, I would say that there are very few like full-time jobs. Like, so for, for the center, I'm the only full-time employee, um, and most of my, you know, my paycheck or salary comes from grant funding, which is a super non-sustainable way uh, <laughs> to fund someone's life. Um, we're able to hire our teenagers also because of grant funding and you know youth in urban agriculture is a really sexy thing for funders right now and so there there happens to be a lot of money there there won't always be a lot of money there which is why the center you know we're doing this hot sauce thing we sell native plants we sell our seedlings we have a retreat facility so we have other uh, revenue streams which is super important um, for nonprofits in general but especially for you know, programs that are trying to hire and sort of change employment rates. As far as like, are our youth going to grow up? If one of them wanted to like keep doing this work, where would they go or what positions exist for them? The answer is none unless we create them. And so this year, you know, last year I had youth who were really excited about coming back. So we created a new program so they could come back and they could be leaders and we found funding for that program. They've already asked me, well, what about next year? I was like, as long as you want to keep working here, I will keep making positions for you. But at some point, I can't do that for every youth. If every single one of our youth wants to come back every single year, there's going to be a cap on the amount of money I can raise and the amount of positions I can create. If one of them wanted, like, you know, say they graduate from high school, they've gone to college, or maybe they didn't go to college, and, but they want, like, a full-time job, we don't have the resources for that. The only way someone would get that is if I left. And I'd be totally willing to leave my job for one of my youth if I thought they were qualified to do it, because I think that's kind of the point, is that we want to be creating positions for you know, people who don't have access to them. I could easily find a job somewhere else. They might not be able to do that as easily. Um, but as far as like real job creation on any sort of large scale, I, you know, urban agriculture I don't think is where that's at. 
personally, and that's probably what you're going to say. You know, the research that yeah. I've done indicates <laughs> the, the same thing across a variety of different types of organizations. So some have been successful in remaining uh, an economically viable farm over time through a lot of creativity and careful tweaking of the business model. Yeah. And uh, others haven't been so successful. In fact, the research that I initially started for this project was in 2011. And by the time I went, went back in 2012, 2013, and tried to follow up with these farmers to ask what they were doing, oftentimes they had changed jobs and left the field. So I think there were concerns at multiple levels that they were reliant on grants that might or might not be there in the following year. Mm -hmm. um, I think as far as the youth aspect, there have been some farms that have tried to create more permanent positions for youth, but I, I think it's been challenging to sustain that over time. The other way that I've heard it framed is that the experience in gardening could lead to an interest in horticulture or landscape architecture or landscaping. So yeah. maybe not taking on full-time employment running an urban farm, but using that experience mm -hmm. as a platform for different career options. Mm -hmm. If I could follow up on that, so this is a question I guess for Camille and Casey. It was so thrilling to hear, I, mean, I was actually very moved to hear that four of your farmers have been able to buy farms for their kids. That is really phenomenal on so many levels. Um, and so wonderfully countercultural. So what's the difference between um, urban farming not seeming to be a place where people can sustain a life and yet Lancaster Farm Fresh farmers, I mean, I understand the, the difference in the settings, but what do you think are the economic difference points? I think part of it for us is scale. You know, we have, uh, you know, access to more land and um, cheaper land. Um, and then, you know, the other thing too is that that's like our culture of, of you know, where we're raised and, and what we know, you know. so like. Some of the farmers, that's really all they know. And, and I don't want it to seem like, you know, all farmers are buying farms from the, for their sons and, and their children. That's not happening at all. It's, it's very rare. I, I think in the, in the grand scheme of things that um, we're pretty much on the same level as far as urban ag agriculture and, you know, um, uh, rural ag agriculture, where, where people are leaving more or losing their farms more. I mean, just in the... Um, you know, we, I said we started in 2006, and you know there was numerous. More, there was there's a lot of CSA farms around, but I see CSA farms drop off year after year, where where they go on to do other things and they're not making it. Or, and you know, I see that with with um, you know all kinds of uh, different agriculture products. I just want to point out that like um, like part of so urban agriculture, like a lot of it right now, is we're thinking like people trying to make a living through farming in, in an urban setting, but like, you know, historically like urban agriculture was like vastly like, um, you know, neighborhood gardens, community gardens, things like that. And a lot of times we kind of over overlook those um, and focus on, you know, urban farming is meaning like this brand new thing that people are just starting to do. Um, in a lot of ways, urban farming has been declining for a long time um, because of the lack of support from the USDA uh, for community gardens that it, you used to have more support like in the 80s and 90s. And also um, just the city you know, having more, you know, talking about Philadelphia, having uh, kind of reprioritizing towards like more like development, like real estate development, um, kind of um, realigning their priorities a little bit away from trying to um, use vacant lots and for, um, for gardening. Uh, so I, don't know, I just want to point out that like that's, that's a whole huge, and, and a lot of, there was a study in 2008 that was done by the UPenn that just like counted like how much produce actually comes from these community gardens. And it's like, you know, the equivalent of like $5 million of produce. Um, and that, you know, that's been declining as these community gardens kind of gradually I think broken up. One, one point that has been made by current farmers within Philadelphia is that Philadelphia is surrounded by wonderful agricultural land and cities aren't necessarily the optimal place to grow yeah. produce. And a lot of the organizations that are in place are there for food production, but also for other reasons. And to be economically competitive, they might have to shift their mission that oh, yeah. leads to, I think, some mm -hmm. discomfort. Mm -hmm. So one person was talking about growing um, m mushrooms because they'd be very expensive and people would pay a lot of money for these mushrooms but that didn't fulfill their goal of providing produce at low cost to people who 
might not have easy access to, to healthy if, foods. If I'm yeah. wrong, I believe there's one farm in Philadelphia that doesn't rely on grant funding, and it's because there's absolutely no like outreach or education as if that's really a part of it. It's just a production farm. Yeah, and I, I guess what I would say to answer that question is the missions are different. So for the most part, urban farms are about education and access, and a lot of them target low-income communities. So they're, they're selling their vegetables for less than what it costs to grow them, whereas rural farmers need to make a living. They don't have the luxury of being able to apply for grants. And so they're selling vegetables at a price that hopefully they might make a little bit of a profit, but it's more expensive than in the urban farms. And I know a lot of us really focus on we don't want to undercut farmers. Like, I don't want to be competing with the farmers from Lancaster County. I want, you know, my demographic is a totally different demographic. I want to be targeting people who would never even be buying their produce because I want farmers to survive. I want them to be able to make a living. And I think that's what a lot of urban agriculture people, they have, we have the same ideas. And so I think it's just a totally different mindset and a totally different market. And that's one reason why it's not economically viable is because we're not trying to make it economically viable. We're trying to serve, you know, under-resourced communities. So this, is, this question is for anyone. Um, having had experience in the sustainable agricultural field for a, a short period of time, one thing that was very frustrating was sometimes policy didn't make sense with what people wanted to do and really what policymakers thought they were trying to do. So I was, for anyone, <clears throat> if there's a policy, like if you could wave a magic wand and get rid of one policy or create a new policy, what would it be? I have one. Do you have one? Let me think. Oh, well, I have so a few, but some of them. My, my magic wand policy is that um, in New Jersey, the state has made it so only farms five acres or larger can accept WIC vouchers. WIC, for those who don't know, is like women, infant, and children. They're vouchers that are mostly single mothers who have lots of, you know, have one child or more get to, to be able to, to feed their families and we cannot accept them because we don't grow on five acres or more. It's a state law, even though WIC's a national program. So if I could change one, that's what it would be. And, and the national, there's no national? That's the rules are dictated by the state. So New Jersey's law is that, and the only way for us to be able to accept them is to either start growing on five acres or to get the law changed. And since and five and acres is five original. times as much as we have, that's not gonna happen, right. so. Any idea what the original? No, we've done a lot of research and talked to a lot of people about it. It, it seems like an arbitrary, yes, yeah, so someone made up a number and it sounded good. <laughs> um, so that's my magic wand law. This is, mine is probably tangential to uh, the agricultural conversation, but I would um, um, get rid of the uh, tipped minimum wage for service workers. I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the Tip to minimum wage, and in Pennsylvania anyway, is 283. So somebody, I mean, 283 an hour, which doesn't even really cover the taxes that you're going to pay on it. Um, so most restaurant workers never see even a fraction of that. Um, you might have a night where you wait on three or four people, and you know, nine and ten hours of work, and you know, you walk with less than forty dollars. You know, legally, technically, the restaurant is obligated to make that up to you. Um, so that you do at least hit minimum wage, but uh, for a job that's as hard as it is, restaurant workers are really getting the short end of the stick, and um, there's huge, powerful lobbies in the same way that there are with agricultural, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, issues around sustainability. Um, you know, restaurant lobbies that that uh, really have a vested interest in keeping workers at the very bottom of of their wage earning capacity. Um, so I think right now, yeah, that's probably that's probably what I would change because I think it would really um, do a lot to uh, <laughs> elevate the way that we think of people in food, people working in food, especially the, the service industry aspect of it. My magic wand for policy change would be um, through the labeling laws, FDA, mm -hmm. to have all manufacturers list on their on the products that it's GMO. Yes. Genetic yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 
volunteer. That's a good one, you know? Uh, it's, it would be wonderful if it was just voluntarily, but it's not. Those manufacturers are voluntarily listing that it is proudly made with non-GMO, but for the, for the rest of manufacturing, it, uh, it is not. So, um, and then it's up then to the person what they want to choose, and it will be abundantly clear how profuse GMO food is mm -hmm. in our system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like you said earlier, it's, you know, change, that policy change. And, you know, all the, um, you know, the, the, the pillars in, in, in that power stream, that whole axis will change through, you know, uh, big, big ag and um, big uh, medical and big pharma. All that will change one bite at a time. I think it really will. It's the only way it will. For a lot of farmers in Philadelphia, land tenure is a concern, and oftentimes the city won't grant leases mm -hmm. that are more than one to three years. So being able to lease land for a longer period of time would be helpful. Mm -hmm. This is leasing land from the city? Vacant lots from the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, I, I, would, I would echo that, you know, about um, just making it, you know, finding ways to create laws that aren't attracting farmers to make all these investments in, in land just so that, you know, it can help um, revitalize the area so that it can be bulldozed over and sold out from under them. I, I'm sort of curious, Casey, I, the Farm bill was recently passed, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert in the farm bill, but my understanding is it's basically a, a pretty big giveaway to a lot of these agribusinesses. And, and sort of, what are the economics? And, and going on Liesel's question about policy, farm bill being obviously a big piece of policy. Um, and, and sort of, what are the economics of sustainable farming when when you have these agribusinesses that I assume can produce food more cheaply? Um, and, and sort of, you know, what what it how, the, the demand, the supply and demand aspect of it for you, how does that play in? Yeah. Well, I guess, um, well, talking about the magic wand issue, it was like, I was trying to think of one, and I was like, I can't. I just abolish the whole system with the wand. <laughs> and, you know, get rid of Monsanto and That's get rid of all these, yeah. you know, <laughs> giant agribusinesses and, and destroy them and, and start over. And um, uh, I think for, you know, I don't know, as far as economics go, I mean, there, there's so much, there's so much like that is wrong with our, our system. I mean, it, it's it's literally a nightmare. I mean, you know, from from the fracking in the forest and you know northern PA to to the raw sewage sludge put on crops, you know, conventional crops and the chemicals and pesticides and neonicotinoids that are killing the bees and the, and the orchards. I mean, there is it's it's we're living in a nightmare and we need to change it. And um, you know, and what we're seeing, you know, I mean. You know, when I pulled up here today, the first truck I saw was a Cisco truck, you know, backed up to the, you know, dock here, and, you know, unloading stuff. And, and um, you know, it was, just, it was just interesting, you know, here we're, we're going to talk about this and what's, what's Cisco doing, you know, what are they doing? They're the largest, you know, uh, food service provider in, in the world. And, um, you know, they're, they, they set, they're, they're, large companies like that are setting the standard now. And we got to, it's, it's hard for us, like people, like small farmers, to really get into, especially institutions, because of all the red tape you got to go through. Because first off, they think, you know, they, they, they look at it as like, oh, you're, you're bringing this dirty product in, it's, you know, or, or there's, is there mice in the boxes? Or, you know, just, just kind of idiotic things to even think about when it comes to, you know, food, because they think it's going to be different than the stuff that's coming in from Argentina or California or China. You know, it's 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 going to be different in a better way because it's nutrient dense and it's actually still alive because you you just harvest it within you know 24 hours. Um, but uh, I think the the thing that goes along with that is that you know in our in our judicial system, you know, you're um, innocent until proven guilty. I think most farmers are, are guilty until proven innocent, and I think that's a you know that's a problem. You know, they there's there there's a there's this greenwashing going on with these larger companies that are you know just promoting what they do and, and kind of stepping on the you know trampling on the f small farmers as they as they do this stuff so and when you say that litigation um, this, this guilty until proven innocent and in what in what sense I mean what what are small farmers facing 
Well, just the, um, you know, the, the, the gap laws that are coming out, the food safety laws that are, that are being proposed, and, and you know, it's, um, I don't know, you, there's just things that are, that are kind of like um, making it harder for small farms to kind of like follow certain policies, and then once they get in, you know, they, it's harder for them to do these things, and then they can't get, they can't access the, the customers or the, you know, the consumers that, that they need to support their farm, so they end up stopping. So, you know, um, you know, simple things are like, you know, dogs running through fields. Like if a, a farmer's dog runs through a field, there's, you know, there's, there's things that they have to do to, you know, take care of that. Um, you know, horses, like we, we have 86 farmers, we don't have one tractor. You know, all of our, uh, all of our, uh, um, um, you know, farm um, with tilling and, and whatnot is done by, you know, horse and mule power. So there's a lot going on there with, um, you know, okay, well, what happens if the, the mules poop in the field? And, and you know, is yeah. that, what are you going to do there? Well, it's, you know, and, and then they're worrying about, like, birds flying overhead and, and you know, pooping wow. on produce and trying to keep, like, wildlife out. Wow. It's, 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 it's seriously, it's, it's just, um, it's getting really crazy. It's and, so profoundly you know, crazy. I mean, the question you have to ask is, well, how did anyone survive up until mechanized agriculture in 1970? So, so the other thing that I that I see that that I don't like with the the whole, um, I guess the, the the movement, once you get to a larger scale, you know, because um, you know, with the way we organize, we're 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 larger than than most because we can be organized together, and um, you know what I see is that we're we have to they're proposing things that you gotta you know you gotta be cleaner, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. You're buying in more plastic, you know. They they want all this like you know all these chem these, these Plastics used. Oh, you, you got to put them in this bag or this wax box or or these ties or you got to you know wear gloves when you handle produce. Uh -huh. It's 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 just too much. It's just like we got to stop it, you know. And it's it's um it's gone too long already. So we we got to stop it here. Or it's even going to get worse. And it's so it's so ironic because like the larger scale, like the health concerns, like that are produced by like huge like agro industries like goes beyond just like oh you didn't wear gloves while you were handling the you know tomato or whatever like it's so ironic. <laughs> yeah. And what is the supply and demand for you? Is this could you grow? Is there enough demand that you get, you could expand greatly or or is it that I mean, what's limiting growth for you? Or is it not enough farmers that are interested? Or well, and I was curious to add to that like. What limit do you desire? Because you well, this comes up a lot, okay? Because you know, as as a an organized collective of farmers, we we are looked at as a larger organization, okay? But in reality, you know, um, our smallest farm is a half acre. Our largest farm is thirty acres. So in the grand scheme of things, these are still small, small farms. Um, you know, I have a farm. My my farm is six acres, and I, I grow medicinal herbs on it. So. Um, we we do have like so you know this this face of oh this you know they look they're you know they, they must be big or whatever we're just well organized and, and what we do works and what I do see that we we could we could take we could grow a lot more um, but we bring it up it comes up all the time when we, we sit down with our farmers and we sit down and we say okay how 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 big do we want to get what what works what doesn't you know and it's like everybody says we want something that we can pass on to the next generation. So that, that tells me that, okay, well, we want something that we can pass on to the next generation of, of you know, children within you know, our farmer, farming community that also will be of CSA members, too, that, that are going to have children and, and, you know, and so forth. So it's, you know, with, I, I forget what the total sales are in, in the organic agriculture, and it's, I don't know, it's like 300 billion or something. It's, something like that. It's, it's huge. It's a huge number. We're just a small portion of that, you know, so... In reality, there's no limits, basically. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, sort of on the on the restaurant side of things too, um, you know, there's certainly there's certainly s restaurants that are you know, serving organic, local, mm -hmm. sustainable foods. Um, you know, some some like White Dog, Russet, co come to yeah. mind. What's the what are, what are the financial considerations there? If, if you have a, a an owner, a chef, a manager who wants to do this, sure. You know what what's the demand for that? Do they do they get do they get sufficient demand? And, and how much of 
of is cost a consideration when they have to start buying products that are local organic? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's obviously there's there's um, this great thing that's happened in the last ten years where there's been this real increasing interest in and push for restaurants to be buying organically, restaurants to be buying locally, restaurants to be uh, having you know seasonal menu items um, to the point where. To be a certain kind of restaurant, I mean, Red Lobster is not participating in this conversation, but to be a certain kind of restaurant, at least in Philadelphia, it's almost a given that you're going to be buying from a farm, at least. Um, and and hopefully, then there are, you know, there, there are folks like uh, like Russet, who, and they're, they're a great example. If you guys want to go to a restaurant that's actually serving local seasonal food, go to Russet. They're uh, a BYOB, and they are doing everything from making their own paprika from dried chilies that they're buying locally to fermenting to canning to uh, curing their own salami. I mean, they are really taking a sort of farmstead approach to uh, the, the, the serving of food in a restaurant context. But for every one of them, there are dozens, literally dozens of people that have that that meant that line on their menu that says we buy from organic and local farms whenever possible and you know what that actually means zero at this point because that might mean during asparagus season or ramp season you know as we're in now they might have a guy that they know who they get you know something from but honestly because it's turned into something that can be used as a marketing tool it is being used as a marketing mm -hmm. tool in the restaurant world mm -hmm. and it really dilutes the impact of the restaurants that actually are doing it that actually are really making an, uh, a concerted effort year round to when it's cabbage season when it's potato season you know plug through those more challenging months instead of just saying you know forget it we're just gonna we're just gonna buy you know, from Cisco or from or from you know the other big restaurant distributor equivalents of Cisco. You know who are who are going to be doing it. Um, in terms of cost, there are you know there are really specific equations that uh, at the restaurant level you say all right you know in order to be a profitable restaurant our food cost needs need not exceed X percentage of our total revenue our gross revenue. Um, it depends on who you ask. Some folks say it's 22%, some people say it's less, some people say it's a little bit more. When you're really running a, uh, a restaurant where you actually are placing a high value on the ingredients, on your raw ingredients, um, if you're buying a, a, a whole veal, for example, that's literally gonna cost you $1,000 one month, you can't look at food in quite the same way as if you say, all right, we have a fixed cost, and we're gonna buy you know, a case of veal chops instead. It's a very different, it turns it into a very different equation that like running a farm for a year, it's a long game. You know, you're gonna have months where you don't make any profit mm -hmm. at all. You're gonna have months where you have negative profit, and then you're gonna have the months where you, where you make your money. The, the issue of sustainability in the restaurant world um, really requires folks to approach running a restaurant differently than the the you know kind of larger culture would have them believe they need to run a restaurant. Um, and I think some I think some folks are doing it, doing it well, and then some folks are uh, t talking as though they're doing it, and they're not necessarily actually you know where the rubber hits the road. Um, they're not actually not necessarily actually doing it um, which is why when you know fair food releases their uh their um you know local business guide you know and they they release their membership um every year those are the folks that i think you can really kind of look to as examples for who are actually making an investment um who are actually making a practice and a priority to buy from to buy from farms to real to give real sourcing uh, you know, attention there. Um, but it isn't necessarily everybody. And that's just talking about food, you know? Sustainability in the restaurant world can comes out, come down to so much more, to energy, to packaging, towards recycling practices, towards composting, towards um, water usage, to all these things that, to be a sustainable restaurant, it's very tempting for restauranters to just talk about their food sourcing practices when in reality, anything that would go into running any kind of institution is gonna also impact mm -hmm. in restaurants. 
question for Mr. Collinbeck. What do you see as sort of the next horizon for Villanova Dining Services? I, mean, I, I know you all have done some really progressive things and that you're, um, I, actually I'd be curious to know more about what the, the national continuum of, of undergrad dining services looks like, but what's feasible or what's desirable next for you all in terms of both nutrition and sustainability? Yeah, um, continually, uh, bring in more uh, non-GMO items um, and expand more for organics. We would like to be able to do that. Um, we're already looking into and, and practicing baking over deep frying items and we're getting some really good um, you know, customer feedback from that and they're really enjoying you know, maybe a sriracha chicken bite that's been baked over deep fried, damaged, you know, damaged oils. So. Um, We've, we've already, and we've always uh, used the term stealth health, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it works too because, for instance, we took our deep frying oil and we changed that a couple of years ago and um, it is expeller pressed, not methane, uh, you know, extracted, and it doesn't have any preservatives in it, no polysiloxanes, no TBHQs, um, and then we also polish it too. We, you know, we, when we use the oil, um, when it breaks down, there's polar molecules in it, and they're known carcinogens. So we use pulverized seashells, and we filter the oil to polish it, to remove the polar molecules, break down the products um, to under 25 parts per million. We always try to keep it somewhere around 8 to 15. And then when the oil is spent and it's no longer good to use or it's healthy, we realize that uh, much of the spent oil and yellow, or what they, what they call yellow grease, goes into making feed for cattle. So we have it written by the president of the, of the company who provides this oil that all the reclaimed oil or spent oil will be used for biodiesel, for paint, and not for feed. And so we specified that. So uh, there's sometimes a small, but very large impacts that we have on, on the students' health. Uh, I believe, you know, people's outcomes and health really begin be about 20 years before conception. So, <laughs> and we take that to heart. We make sure that, you know, these young ladies and gentlemen are eating the highest consistent quality, you know, food. So it would be, in, in terms of, of those things like that, more whole grains, um, behind the scenes and working with our executive chef to develop a, uh, a whole grain or ancient grain pizza dough. Because right now our, you know, our, our current state of affairs is that much of our modern wheat is so highly hybridized and changed that um, you know, everyone reacts you know, histologically and serologically to wheat inside the gut, just as someone who has celiac. So, uh, and that's you know, those are some things that I think that we could, we can do and help to impact. So, more whole grains, more fruits, more vegetables. So. Well, it's already after ten o'clock. I think there's a lot of lot of interest in this subject, and um, we can keep talking for for quite a while. Um, definitely, would like to thank all of our panelists for for taking the time to join us and, and provide some insights. Thank mm -hmm. you.